Well, good morning, everybody. Since the room is already full, which I take as a fantastic sign of just how much interest there is in the topic, and since there is a lot to discuss, I think we might be efficient and actually start a couple of minutes early. And Vishal Sika, who is the CEO of Infosys, can join us um, when he arrives. I think, frankly, with just four people on the panel, we'll have quite enough to talk about anyway. Um, my name is Gillian Tett. I'm the US Managing Editor of the Financial Times. And I am absolutely delighted to have a terrific panel of people to talk about something which really, in my view, is the burning issue of the age, which is how to create inclusive growth in the dig digital age. Um, might be subtitled, How on Earth Do We Create Enough Jobs When the World is Full of Robots, Barcodes, and Smartphones? <laughs> which is the big challenge. I mean, when I look around the world today, and think about this issue, I often think we are living, as Trollope might say, in the best of times and the worst of times. Um, I was given some statistics. Great, we have a full panel. I haven't yet introduced anyone, so I will okay. introduce the whole group yeah. in a minute. So, um, we started earlier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it is a faster to walk here than to get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the points the Davos organizers are trying to make, that actually we should all be walking. <laughs> and um, doing great stuff for our heart and the environment. Yes, yeah, so, we're one of these. Um, yes, exactly. Um, so best of times and worst of times. I mean, I was handed some st statistics just before this panel from the WEF suggesting that there are about 6 billion mobile phones in the world, about as many as there are people. Soon they will overtake it. Apparently 90% of the world's population will have mobile phones by 2020. Apparently 3 billion people are already on the internet. Of course, that still leaves three billion who are not, but the numbers are rising all the time. So in many ways, we have seen the most extraordinary technological change in a very short space of time that I would argue outstrips anything we've seen before in terms of the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution. That's the good news. The bad news is that there are estimates that within the next 10 to 20 years, 45%, 45% of the jobs in America will be replaced by digital machines. And that's just America. Um, one of my favorite statistics is from Brian Arthur from the Palo Alto Research Institute, who suggests that if you look at all the economic functions performed by digital networks in America, they will soon be equivalent to the output of the entire American economy. Essentially, you're creating a second, if you like, shadow economy off offshore in America. So the really big question is, what on earth are those humans going to do who don't have a barcode implanted on their brain? And you only need to look at the statistics to see that you're seeing great job growth for highly skilled workers, you're seeing jobs growth for unskilled workers, you're seeing rising income inequality though, the middle is hollowed out. And those of you who stayed up late to watch President Obama's State of the Union speech um, and are looking equally haggard like me today, will know that income inequality is absolutely the key theme, not just of Davos, but of the political agenda. So we have a fantastic group of panelists to talk about this. Um, I don't think we're necessarily representing such income diversity, but we do have a lot of views here today. A cheap shock. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm the bottom 90% by spectrum. Davos. <laughs> exactly. Well, anyway, on my far left, your right is Eric Brindelsen, who is a professor, well known to many of you from MIT, wrote a fantastic book last year on the implications of this. Um, so he will be providing an academic framing to it all. Next to him is Peter Grauer, chairman of Bloomberg, which of course is one of the companies at the forefront of change in the financial sphere when it comes to technology. And on my left is another representative of the financial sector who's very involved in digital transformation, Ajay Banga, CEO of MasterCard. On my right is, um, sorry, I am having a, uh, sorry, Hans Vestberg, CEO of Ericsson. I won't even try to pronounce the first part of Ericsson's name in Finnish these days. Um, and on my far right, your left, is Vishal um, Sika, who is from Infosys from India and um, CEO. So I'd like to start with um, Professor Brunelson, Eric. Um, when you hear the gloomy prognoses about job creation or the lack of it, the number of jobs being replaced by robots and barcodes, do you feel depressed? Are you worried that you are eventually going to be 
outsource to a barcode yourself? <laughs> I feel challenged, and I think we all should feel challenged. Um, you know, the reality is, is that technology's always been destroying jobs. It's always been creating jobs. But recently, we have had um, a, a kind of a, a change. Um, for a couple hundred years, we were creating jobs as fast or faster as we were destroying them. But recently, that has leveled off in the United States and other uh, advanced countries. And perhaps even more troubling, um, median income has stagnated. And uh, that's a pattern we didn't see uh, earlier. You mentioned the Industrial Revolution was, was a, a real inflection point in human history, where before that, living standards were really pretty stagnant. And then in the couple centuries since James Watt invented the, the steam engine, uh, living standards have grown maybe 50-fold or, or more, depending on how you measure it. Um, today, the pie continues to grow bigger. We're at record wealth, record productivity, more billionaires uh, and, and millionaires than ever before. But um, the average person in, in uh, developed countries isn't participating in that growing pie. And the reality is that there's just no economic law that says that everyone is guaranteed to get a piece of, of this growing pie that technology is bringing. Um, part of it is because the technologies of, of what Andy McAfee and I call the second machine age are somewhat different than the first machine age. Uh, one thing is that the things are happening a lot faster in many ways. Um, we all know that Moore's Law, doubling of computer power every 18 to 24 months. We went back and, and looked at the steam engine, and that also doubled in power, but it took about every 75 years for it to double. <laughs> so it's a, a much different pace of, of progress there. Uh, more importantly, the new technologies are digital and networked, um, and, and you mentioned that. And when you digitize something, a song or, 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 or news or, or, or anything, um, that has three very interesting characteristics. First, um, you can make a copy of that original essentially for, for nothing, zero cost. Secondly, each of those copies is an exact replica, a perfect copy of the original. And thirdly, each of those copies can be transmitted anywhere in the country or anywhere on the planet almost instantaneously. Now think about it, free, perfect, and instant. Those are three adjectives we didn't apply to goods and services throughout most of history. And you can, as you can imagine, they really upend a lot of economics based, you know, economics based on, on scarcity. Uh, they lead to some new kinds of market outcomes. Uh, particularly, you tend to see power law distributions of uh, uh, sales, revenues, and income, um, often winner-take-all markets. Uh, there's not much point in, in having uh, uh, 300,000 different people writing tax preparation programs, even if you had them individually working as uh, tax preparers previously, but a piece of software um, can replace many of those functions. And so you end up having the potential for the economy to have vastly more wealth, but also some individuals to become very wealthy. And as I mentioned, many billionaires have been created in the past decade, and, and that, that's great in many ways. But it also means that many people who were previously doing those more routine kinds of jobs, the ones that can be automated most easily, are having a harder time finding uh, new kinds of work, uh, whether it's in robots and warehouses and factories, or whether the even bigger group of people doing information work and knowledge work. And what I spent a lot of time working in the, visiting the labs at, at MIT and in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, and I can tell you that the technologies that are in the pipeline that are coming out in the next decade are even more remarkable than what we've seen already having these big effects over the past decade. Uh, we ain't seen nothing yet in terms of the impacts of technology. And that means we do need to be very what's going to happen in terms of jobs and, and income. And ultimately, uh, my view on this is that the technology itself does not determine the income distribution. It's the combination of the technology and our institutions, the way we organize work. The Industrial Revolution that I mentioned earlier um, not only brought along some amazing technologies, but huge tectonic changes in the way, say, we educate people. Um, mass public education was something that was introduced in the 1820s and 1830s, something that seemed you know, a crazy socialist idea at the time. There were changes in the tax code, social security, corporate organization, many other changes. And we will need comparably large changes in our institutions, our organizations, and our skills going forward if we're going to have shared prosperity. Well, that's a fantastic set of ideas to frame that with. It raises a lot of questions on the policy front, not least about whether it's time to talk seriously about the taboo R word, or the word that's taboo in America, which is redistribution in some form or not, whether education alone will be enough. But I'd like to ask, I saw Hans um, nodding enthusiastically <coughs> there. 
Um, do you think that 45% um, projection in terms of the jobs that will be replaced by machines is a reasonable projection? And what does it mean for a company like yourself? Uh, if, you, if you start from the beginning what the professor said, I mean, we are in, a, I would say, the fifth technology revolution, and you mentioned a couple of them before. We have all seen them having two faces, and all of them, of course, have transformed people, businesses, and society. We are now in the midpoint of the fifth technology revolution, which is all about mobility, broadband, and cloud. I mean, you mentioned some numbers in the beginning. We have three billion mobile broadband subscriptions in the world. It took us 100 years to get one billion people connected to a fixed. The next five years is going to go so much faster. So by 2020, eight billion mobile broadband subscriptions. That means that we're three times as many people on this earth have access to internet the next five years. And it took us 25. It is just a mind-boggling speed we're going to have in front of us and, of course, bringing down the barriers. And it will impact us. Many of you already have a smartphone. That I would, you are still a minority in the world. The ma majority of the world's population are on 2G. They are still on, uh, on a, on a non-connected device. But the next five years is just going to be bl blooming up in the world. 85% of the Earth's population will have 3G or 4G by 2020. And, and this we need to think about because, first of all, we're going to have people being impacted, going to be connected. The unconnected will be connected. Businesses will be transformed. Everything that you can do when you are connected, if it's a transport company, if it's a software company, logistic company, uh, whatever, financial company, all of them will have the po potential to be transformed. And finally, the whole society will be transformed because this will be the 21st century's infrastructure. Citizens will and should have access to education, healthcare. Uh, we should be able to work with combating CO2 emission because this infrastructure will be the biggest, I would say, uh, tool for society to actually combat some of the biggest challenges. And a company like us, being in 180 countries, basically building all the networks all around the world, 50% of all 4G traffic is going through all infrastructure. Our job is to see that that technology can cater for all these three differences, the people, the business, and the society. And I think that's what we have in front of us. And of course, there will be coming some challenges. In all technology revolutions, you have found challenges. But remember, the majority is positive development for a planet, sustainable development. Then we need to find the challenges with it. Uh, security, privacy, uh, and of course, how we're going to create jobs. But in all these five technology revolutions, you have always created jobs in technology. And we will not and we should not stop this technology revolution. And just matter of interest, before I turn to Vishal, um, Hans, when you look at your workforce today, um, is it growing or shrinking? Are you placing your own workers with, with robots? No, it's growing. We, remember, we are a service company as well. I mean, we, but we are changing the, the type of it. So last year, I mean, r roughly, I mean, you can say that we, we hired 19,000 new employees. We're 115,000 employees. But also 14,000 left the company because we are transforming so fast. So that's the only way for us to be relevant for our customers, for the industries we're working with, different uh, sectors like utilities that need smart grids or mobile operators all around the world. So we need to change. And of course, the gravity has changed as well. I mean, whole Asia is growing tremendously. North America has been in the forefront of technology. We need people there. Historically, we had 50% of our employees in Sweden. I can tell you, we're far from that. What are you now in Sweden? Yeah, uh, Less than 15%. That's quite a change. Um, I dare say many of them probably are in, in India now. But, um. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the largest uh, workplace we have. Vishal, what are your perspectives on this? Because, of course, you um, come from a country initially which um, is seeing very rapid increase of internet um, penetration, um, where up until now it's been a beneficiary in terms of moving jobs from the Western world to India. But do you think that trend's going to continue? I, I mean, it has to go through a very fundamental change. The, uh, when, we, when we think about robotic jobs and automation, um, the, the, the main thing we hear, obviously, is that the kinds of jobs that companies like mine have done will be replaced by this automation. And I have a different perspective on that. Uh, the traditional sort of downward spiral of cost is not the right way to go. It's not the right direction to go. Uh, a better way is to focus more on automation and to use that to amplify people's ability. Mm. I think that when what, what Eric was talking about, when we look at the Industrial Revolution, 
uh, or closer to my uh, to India, the Green Revolution, technology always in the long run amplifies people's ability. It makes people more productive. Um, it makes people do more with less for more, as <laughs> Professor Mashelkar once said. So my sense is that we can get to a future where people are still at the center of what we do, but we amplify people's abilities with technology, with software, with automation, so that people can do you know, more with, with less. That to me, I, I studied AI, my, my doctorate is in AI, and I don't see for the foreseeable future a situation where people will become completely irrelevant because of AI. That, uh, as far as I can see, um, yes, it is true that more and more of the problem solving of doing the things that are prescribed, the things that are well defined will continue to be more and more automated. But there are always exceptions, there are always things that require human judgment and oversight. And then beyond that, beyond problem solving, there is the great new frontier of problem finding. And, te and techniques like design thinking help us become better at problem finding. So these are things that people will continue to, to do. And technology creates a displacement, and there is a temporary replacement of jobs, but it also creates a tremendous new set of opportunities. I mean, I see a world right now where there are 18 million cloud computing jobs that are open. Eight million are just in China. So there is a, gr as, uh, there is a great need for next generation kinds of technologies and to bring people into these kinds of opportunities. So we should all be putting our kids straight into the cloud. I, I, think, I think that th that is a software literacy is a very fundamental thing. Uh, that is why we have the Infosys US Foundation, which uh, Sandeep, who is sitting here somewhere, <coughs> um, he was working on my wife, who is sitting here. She's running the US Foundation. They are working on bringing computing literacy, um, software development skills to everyone, from children as well as people right. who are being displaced. Well, my own daughter is a very keen coder. I live in fear that one day I'll wake up and discover she's hacked into the FT or NSA or something, <laughs> or Bloomberg. <laughs> so, <laughs> there we go. But just very briefly, before I turn to Ajay, Ajay um, how many people do you employ? 170,000. And what was it, say, five years ago? Um, ten years ago, it was one-tenth of this. Okay, so that's job creation. That okay. Tre tremendous job creation. We recruited 40,000 people last year. So my sense is, I mean, if you look at, the, I mentioned the Green Revolution, 80% of India, when I was a young kid, um, Ajay probably remembers this, um, uh, were in farming, in agriculture. And despite that, India was, had a food shortage. And then the Green Revolution happened, and, and you know, board laws, uh, germ-free seeds, and so forth. And people became more productive. The farmers became more productive. So even though you know, the absolute number of farmers <coughs> has still increased, their productivity has increased dramatically, and, and India is self-sufficient now. It's the largest exporter of wheat, one of the largest exporters of rice, even milk is exported. So that is the point. I think that if we can convert continually technology as a creator of jobs, as an amplifier of people's abilities, we will be okay. Right. Well, that's a reason to be cheerful, which is always good at the start of Davos. Um, Ajay, how do you see it from your perspective? Is it Ajay? So I guess uh, we've got a lot of ground here. I'm actually a little bit where Eric is that, first of all, I think you should stop trying to figure out whether technology will or will not alter the job landscape and whether you can hold that back. It will. It just will. And there's no question of holding it back. So given that, the question is what do you then do about it as civil society and as people in companies? And my belief that the single big thing you can do is to put investment into education and infrastructure. The generation of young people is not faced with the same mismatch of skills versus requirements that today's generation is working its way through. So be it coding like your daughter, who one day will probably hack into the chip that we're going to embed in your <laughs> forehead, right? <laughs> or, or, and then direct you in a different direction. Don't give her any ideas. There you go. Or, or it be any form of such knowledge. I think that's going to be an important role for governments to play. Secondly, technology is transforming <laughs> everything. I mean, all of you are carrying smartphones around, and my friend Budi there is using his iPhone. If you had, he's got an iPhone. If you had a Samsung of the latest type, that one has the computing power of, he's got that too. Well, that's just, <laughs> <laughs> this guy's a problem. But, <laughs> it's kind of there you go. Yeah, he's, got, he's, he's got a television want, screen. You always wonder why there's more that, mobile phones in the world than people. It's because <laughs> he's, we he's, are collectively represent at least half of them. Yeah, so. Peter, Peter, Peter thinks he's looking at Bloomberg on that screen. Anyway, so the fact is that that phone, that Samsung phone, has the computing power that is 11 times 
the computing power of the computers that guided Apollo 11 to the moon. That phone, forget the cloud, which only makes it multiples of that. Just that instrument has 11 times the computing power. So you go back to the time when, when, uh, when encyclopedias and book and printing took away the control of knowledge dissemination from the churches and priests and temples and, and those guys and gave it to people to read. Well, now that is taking away everything, all arbitrage, and giving it to the individual who's walking around on the street. Now, if you have that in your pocket, and you have the amount of data that's being generated from that in your pocket and going elsewhere, how can that not be an unbelievable opportunity to connect people? And I believe that the reason that, that uh, jobs aren't there or that people face difficulties is that they're missing from a network. So if you aren't connected to the education network, you've got a problem. If you aren't connected to a social network to help you find a job and you're a young person, you're screwed. If you aren't connected into a network that allows you to get financing and you're a small business person, you're dead. So all the things that are happening right now are about networking and networks. And so if governments invest in technology and education and infrastructure, and if we as the others can use the power of that phone that Budi is carrying around to help network people, then I think you have a real chance to talk about a future that will be very different from this current gloomy prognosis of 45% of the people won't have a job. That's one angle, but technology is not going to stop. And it's got so much usefulness out there. Well, I want to return to that in a minute, uh, and in particular look at the question about whether education alone is going to be the answer. Um, yeah. I mean, I do yeah, I've got some other thoughts on that, but I'll let you finish. Okay. You're going to give Peter a chance to say what he has to. OK, well, Peter, <laughs> you are in the hot spot. Um, do you think that, I mean, first of all, do you believe the 45% number? Do you think that's a realistic assessment of what's happening in the American economy? I mean, does it apply to bankers or financial services people? <laughs> well, we've certainly seen it in terms of the contraction in the financial yeah. services industry, and I expect as technology continues, we're going to see more and more of that. But, but I, I want to just underscore what Ajay said. I, I, I think the, the pace of technological change is immutable. It's just not going to stop. So the, the issue that we as a group should be debating and thinking about, and I hope we'll spend some time talking about, and that is how do we deal with the current institutions that exist, whether it's education in, in the union situation in the United States, whether it's tenured professors in colleges and universities, some of the fundamental issues that basically we have to change to be able to take advantage of what's been going on from a technological renaissance that we're all in the midst of right now. Uh, and I think those kind of, there's a lack of symmetry between the pace of change from a technology point of view and the institutions that we have today, not only in virtually every country in the world, and the political leadership that exists that has to have the will to change some of the fundamental premises that these institutions have been built on so that we create an environment where we can leverage technology, create jobs, and obviously this issue around uh, income uh, income disparity and try and minimize that to the extent possible. So, so I think there's some very fundamental issues underlying all of this that we as a society have to address. Otherwise, there are going to be some, I think, sig potentially some significant challenges that, that we haven't thought about. Right. right. So I uh, connected thought on that one, which is more in, in the specific space that we're trying to do at our company, is that two and a half billion adults don't have access to any form of financial services. So just translate that into lost productivity for a second and think of having to go pay a bill and stand in a queue because you've got to pay it and you can't do it the way you and I are used to it. Or think about not getting access to credit at a reasonable price. Or think about not being able to send money to your mother or your brother without some unbelievable cost involved. When you put all those together, that's a pretty unproductive group of people. That's half the world's adults. The other way to look at it is that half the world's population is female. And clearly, there's something wrong with the way that job opportunities and compensation for them flows through. So if you look at President Obama's State of the Union address yesterday, he's talking about childcare and equal pay and the like. The fact is, women, I was talking to, talking to Peter about this, women in the US have the same level of education as women in the Nordics. And yet the participation in the workforce of women in the Nordics is way higher than that of women in the US. And the difference is caused by the absence of capabilities and facilities for them to be active participants. Childcare is one of them. 
um, maternity leave, paid maternity, and by the way, paternity leave, mm. which you need if you're going to be supportive, is a problem in the US. And then you come to the issue of paying women differently for the same job done. And you put all those three things together, you've got half the world's population being unproductive. Yeah. You've got half the world's adults being unproductive because they don't have a basic financial account. That's a pretty crappy situation. Now, technology can change that because every device will be a connected device. Every device will be a device of commerce. We can change that, but you need a public-private partnership, which is the point about education, infrastructure, and the like from government. Governments need to certify identity. If governments don't certify a digital identity, no corporation will take on the risk in today's regulatory environment of opening an account for an individual if you don't know that that person is Peter Grauer, who lives at this address, and these are his fingerprints and his irises. And they need to create a regulatory box for everyone to play in. And so there's a lot of stuff we can talk about in that space. What I'm trying to say is that technology actually can help in all of those. Mm -hmm. It can help transform this whole idea mm -hmm. of making half the world's population, whether women or people who don't have an account, become productive contributors. And that's what we're looking at in a positive way yeah. as compared to the jobs that may go away, which is a problem we've got to deal with. We've got to deal with cybersecurity, Absolutely. as Hans mentioned. We've got to deal with privacy. You know, the internet was formed in a way where today everybody's information is public. You can Google me and you'll get to know the apartment my daughter bought and <coughs> lived downtown. Why the hell should that be in public spaces? It is. Because there is no privacy for an individual in today's form. Maybe there will be in tomorrow's form. And maybe there should be. I don't know, but that's a debate worth having. But so there's a whole angle to be done, but there's an opportunity. Well, I'm keen to come back to the question about how you actually deal with the education issue and the institutional yeah. issue in a moment. Yeah. But just before we do that, I mean, the underlying premise of this panel is that the internet just keeps spreading and spreading, technology keeps spreading and spreading in an upward line like that. And it always reminds me of 2006 and 2007 at Davos when everyone <coughs> thought that financial innovation would keep going like that and all the CDOs and liqui liquefaction in the markets would go like that in one straight upward line. It always makes me concerned when everyone they assumes... Did. The water came over our heads, that's correct. Well, exactly. <laughs> and I just um, moderated a fascinating panel with Fade from ICANN um, and Ackleitner, which basically said what happened to bankers could easily happen to the tech sector in terms of the reputational collapse. Are any of you concerned about that, that actually this premise underlying this panel that technology is just going to get better and better could actually be disrupted by a serious cyber attack, cyber collapse? But, but it did. I mean, we, we went through this in 2001, 2002, which was the dot-com bubble burst. Yeah. So we have been through it. And, and it's probably naive to think that there won't be a cycle of some kind. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't know necessarily what that cycle may be. But uh, it, it certainly, my guess is it will happen at some point, and it will be unpleasant. But as is always the case, we'll figure out a way to recover and move yeah. back forward. Right. Yeah. Okay. My, my, my sense on that is that uh, that's actually a great example of exactly the thing that we are talking about. If you look at the financial crisis, it was a great example of you know, deeply technical techniques, quantitative techniques, basically taking over decision making. And uh, I read this fascinating set of articles around how this happened. And of course, Michael Lewis wrote a great book about this as well. The, the unknown risks were just put away in a corner, never to be looked at again. And that, those are the kinds of places where the human rationality, the human judgment can be that exceptional cover that guides our abilities around automation. Uh, so unchecked automation will inevitably lead to situations like this, where what we think of as a black swan event will happen. Uh, and that is why we need this technology in the context of human empowerment to, to, to have that outer frame of judgment and rationality guiding us. Um, so I, I do see that it is uh, crashes like that or collapses like that are inevitable, but they bring us back to our ability to keep things sane by bringing the human judgment into the mix of these things. So if nothing else, we have job creation for risk officers. <laughs> yes, yes. And Great. Sure. And That's it. Well, that'll right. make the lawyers Thank in the room very happy right. anyway. Um, sorry, Eric, I... Yeah. So well, I, I would fundamentally distinguish uh, at least three different ways that, that the tech sector is uh, affecting the economy. I mean, you refer to, to the kinds of crashes in, in the dot-com bubble, but that's really just a, a very surface kind of thing that's happening, um, you know, with, with the stock market, and, and it's going to affect the fortunes of a lot of people, maybe a lot of people in this room, but it, it doesn't have as much of a, 
an impact on the fundamental changes that we were just hearing about from, from really all of the panelists in terms of connecting the world's people. That, I think, is, is pretty inexorable. That's going to continue uh, the underlying technological capabilities once people are connected. Um, and then the third level is that beyond that, that the real changes are the reinvention of economic institutions, uh, work practices, the skills. I would venture that even if, if somehow, and it's not going to happen, but even if somehow the technology froze, um, there would be a few decades of uh, reinvention of our economy that would have to continue just based on the technologies that we all have available right now. So, so I, I'm not the least bit worried about those more fundamental and pervasive and really tectonic uh, trends uh, changing or slowing down. I'm, I'm quite confident they will actually accelerate over the next few decades. Right. Um, well, but I'm going to actually employ a bit of innovation myself and rip up the normal order and turn to questions in a minute because we do have a lot of people in the audience who frankly are extremely knowledgeable about the issue. But the one thing I want to ask, ask you first though is, is this. I'm often told in America by very wealthy people who dislike the idea of talking about redistribution or talking about income inequality um, who are worried about class warfare I'm often told by them that actually the key solution is education. If only you can just educate everyone, then all these problems of income inequality will go away. Do you believe that? Or do you think that's simply a rather convenient fig leaf for avoiding talking about the other issues? I don't think the problem will go away in the sense that if you look at the gap between the haves and the have-nots, it's widened. I mean, at the Industrial Revolution, the gap between the per capita income of the world's richest and poorest nations was like 10, 12 times. It's now over 100 times. So I think that gap isn't going to go away just by education. But there are two aspects in life. One is do you take money physically and redistribute it to the others? And the other is do you enable those people to have a productive <coughs> life? It right. will not all be equal in earning. Right. But you could, if you get the right levels of education, be it education in community colleges and vocational schools, for the right kind of job opportunities, or be it as doctors and lawyers and engineers, or be it as PhDs in artificial intelligence, or guys like you and me who barely have intelligence, let alone artificial intelligence. <laughs> that that kind you. of stuff, that kind Thank of you. stuff is, is all good. That's why I'm a journalist. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I just run a company. So the, if you go through that, I don't know that that will go away, but I do believe you create a better and more level playing field by giving people the opportunity to participate productively. That's why I was talking about the aspect of giving women an, an opportunity to participate productively. The, I think that civil society and government doesn't have to focus on punitive redistribution as much as giving people opportunities by creating the right infrastructure and the right ability for them to succeed. That's the point I was making. Can, right. can I Peter. Just, one of the things that I spend a significant <coughs> amount of my time on is an organization that's involved in low-income access to higher education. And it's vocational education, it's community colleges, and it's four-year colleges and universities. And we have, over the last nine years, affected the lives of a half a million students that otherwise would not have gone on to higher education. And the data, I, I, I should have these numbers off the top of my head, I don't. But if you look at the income and earning power based on each level of education, certainly in the United States, and my guess is it's the same elsewhere, it is quite dramatic. And so part of the mission is getting more people with higher education, better developed skills, whether they're skills that are based on technology or otherwise, uh, and, and I'm very much in Ajay's camp, uh, and, and that is, I think that the inclusiveness created by that and the aspirations that education will in turn support for those people is really powerful in terms of economic growth going forward and, and gets us away from some of the issues around redistribution of wealth, which I think are politically very incendiary. Maybe I can say one. My view, I mean, of course, I mean, there are different angles of education, and I think that we all understand that education and people understanding challenges will, of course, have a much better chance to grow and, and prosper. So I, I think that's no debate about that. I, of course, think about uh, a big proportion of the world's population that doesn't get the education today. 
And I think that's where, uh, where I, of course, are rolling yeah. out networks and getting people connected mm -hmm. in rural places, which for the first time in their life get a device in their hands. And I can tell you, they don't call their grandmother and tell them they're good. They're Googling, they go into the yeah. internet, they get the information. That, of course, is an enormous important thing for transforming the world. And think about that. Maybe we can say that governments have some thought about it, but today, 140 countries in the world has a broadband plan. They are starting to think that this is an infrastructure they need for rolling out education, for getting citizens' information, <laughs> or doing healthcare. And I think that what we're going to see the next year, and I fully agree with Eric, this technology will just continue to roll. And we're going to get a platform that is so big when it comes to mobility and broadband. And it's just how we're going to be able to use that. By 2020, it's still going to be 1.7 billion people that doesn't have connections. 1.7. Out of them, 300 million will not have coverage. Mm. So it's still 1.4 billion. They will have coverage, but they cannot afford to get connectivity. Mm. So our job is new business models, private-public partnerships. How can we get them to be included in it? Because all in all, they will get the information. They will have a possibility to prosper. And I think that's... Of course, you can think about the U.S. education system is extremely important, but think about the words that is not getting education at all. And girls that have to stop after the first grade or something, that is important for our society. Yeah. No, and um, my point is, I think education, especially lifelong education, we have to think yeah. about education is not something that is confined to yeah. uh, the first 21, you know, 16 out of the first yeah. 21 years of our lives, four years in a college that is in a particular place, but instead it is something that we do for our entire lifetimes and we do wherever we are it comes to mm. your point about uh, connectivity so uh, rethinking education in a way that it is something that we do wherever we are and that we do for our entire lifetime is something that i believe is extremely necessary as the rate of change on these technologies <coughs> continually increases right i mean eric do you think it's time to rethink say the way that american universities are organized say the tenure system no question. I, I think so. I think that just to building on what, what Hans and Vishal just said, I think um, education needs to reach more people. It needs to, uh, uh, people need to go uh, lifelong and be connected more ways. And universities are being reinvented. They're maybe on the lagging edge of the digital revolution. Um, I, I don't know that the, the uh, tenure system makes a, makes a big difference in, in what's going on here. But I think one of the things that we're seeing is the, um, is the, uh, use of new technologies like massive online open courseware and it helps reach all those people you know a, a course we taught at MIT that went to a few hundred thousand people on, on circuits one of the kids in, in Mongolia uh, took this course he got a, a perfect score um, we admitted him to MIT uh, shortly thereafter he was like 16 years old um, but that's an example of somebody who wouldn't have previously gotten access to it but more fundamentally it's not just um, using these digital technologies to, to you know, have free, perfect, and instant uh, access to, to content that they didn't get previously and reaching more people. It's also another aspect of it, which is when you digitize things, you tend to datafy them, and you're able to measure them much better. And we found that the biggest change when we started um, putting our courses in, in digital form was we got much more detailed feedback about what was happening, how people were using the course on, on a hour by hour, minute by minute, even second by second uh, basis. And, and we were surprised by some of the things we saw that, that for instance, um, we found that many people did not look at the lectures before they started working on the problem sets um, as the way you expected. So we changed <laughs> things around. We said, okay, we'll, put, we'll give you the problem first and then we'll give you the tools for solving the problem. And, and that seemed to be a much more way, effective way of engaging people. And we learned a lot of other things. And ultimately, this means we're not just going to have education reaching more people for a longer time, but also I think that the, the quality of the education is going to be on, a, on an improving level, um, much as we've seen in other areas, you know, Bloomberg and lots of other companies are constantly testing um, their, their products with, with consumers, A-B testing, and it's time for universities to sort of adopt that uh, experimental, rapid innovation, improving kind of mindset. Ultimately, all, every industry is going to have to do that. Yeah. But if we do it with education, we can help close yeah. some of this skills gap that, that has right. been emerging. Right. And just one quick question before I turn to the audience, and this is a straight yes-no from all of you. Who thinks that income inequality is going to decline over the next five years? Let's say the Western world. Is that yes or no? Yes or no. Well, maybe you'd like a few, few moments to think I about income it. Income inequality have an is going to decline. Um, it's not going to decline, in my view. Okay, no? 
thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking. I hope not. But I hope not. But I hope I, not. I, I go for that. I'm an optimistic boy, so I hope not. So I would say it's not going to decline, although I wish it would change. Okay. Yeah. No. No. It's a trick question. It's our choice. The people in this room can help decide whether or not that happens. <laughs> so you're basically voting. Ah, <laughs> yeah, he's the academic. He's the that is the professor. Okay. Yeah. Eric, that's that so disappointing. That's okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to quickly ask the audience that and then turn to questions. Who thinks income inequality is going to decline over the next five years? Around the world in developing let's, let's, let's say the Western world, okay, because that's where. Western. Okay. Well, and you ha all have to vote. You all have to vote. Okay, who thinks it's going to increase? Wow. Right. We need to work. Okay, well, that is a very good counterpoint to the optimism about technology. So, who would like to ask the first question? Don't all ask once, okay? Um, all right, let's start. Okay, we'll start with Laura over here. Um, Laura Tice. Ask questions much or comments. And listen, because we are, because there are a lot of you waving hands, please keep them short to but the point. And it's not compulsory to identify yourself, but it would be courteous. I'm going to be very short. I'm Laura Tyson. I'm a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. The posing of the question, redistribution versus something else, I think is not the right posing of the question. If we, everyone agrees there's massive support here for educational reform, historically speaking, the, the public sector has been a major force behind spending on public education. Education is not free. We can call it free, it's not free. Mm -hmm. It requires a significant amount of investment. If governments are going to do all of such investments, they need re revenue. If they need revenue, where are they gonna get it? So I actually think uh, we need to discuss <laughs> if we're going to revolutionize education, the cost to the public sector, how you can have the private sector do it instead of the public sector, which is a little bit what's happening, with uh, income inequality, what you see is a massive amount of engagement by very wealthy individuals in transforming education. But the revenue is going that way. So it's not redistribution versus education. Redistribution, I think we should think about more. What's the role of the public sector? And what is the revenue stream for the public sector? Where does it come from? And I'll just end with research, because it's, it's, it's wonderful to sort of talk about the need to get rid of tenure or the need to go after elite universities. But all of the wonderful research we're talking about, much of those ideas came from government support of the building of a research base in the United States. Mm -hmm. Do Great we want to not have that for the public sector anymore? Great point. Well, I'm going to take a few more comments and questions um, as part of this crowdsourcing. So why don't I go across the room in a sweep, there and then there. We should all be chipped and then you wouldn't have to waste time to sort of go around. But Tim, I'm in Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization. I'd perhaps like to reinforce some of the things that Hans was saying. You know, the US is but 4% of the world's population. Let's get real. Um, <laughs> the, the, the fundamental issues are what's happening in some of the poorest countries of the world. And, and that is where inequality is undoubtedly getting greater because perhaps the way we've abused um, technology to date. And, and surely this is a platform where we can you know, represent the voices of the voiceless and, uh, and realize that, that we have to make fundamental changes in what we're doing. I look at the SDGs, there isn't something about uh, universal access to broadband in, in, in some of the poorest countries. We can do this. We can roll that out. Everyone in this room can make that happen, but we're not doing it. We have made that choice. Uh, and another voice, as we've heard about women, but people with disabilities. You know, those of us who have more disabilities can benefit from this technology far more than those of us, as in this room, who generally have fewer disabilities. Look at Andrea's performance last night, how powerful that was to show that one disability doesn't make us disabled. So again, let's commit to some of these voiceless people and make a difference. We can do it. We're not doing it because we're focusing on economic growth, on greed, and, uh, and making greater profits. Thank right. you. Thank you. And maybe just comment on that. I think the comment is excellent. I mean, the proposal right now for the new SDGs, the 17 proposed, I mean, which are all big challenges on Earth. I mean, only four of them have some ICT in on them. And, and all of them. Four of the targets. Yes. So targets. Yeah, so it's then it's more targets. It's even less yeah. Than that. So, so 
we believe that technology is one of the most transforming things there's going to be because there's going to be phones in the hands of anyone. So, of course, if we can use that to fight poverty, education, healthcare, malaria, whatever, that's going to be extremely important. And I think that I, I fully agree. I'm uh, Christopher Pissari, this is just Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. I want to go back to the question that you raised about jobs. And uh, I mean, the, the advantages of technology and education are undisputed, but there's no escaping the fact that the vast majority of jobs that will be created to replace the ones lost to technology will be in low skill services that, are, that cannot be mechanized, that are demanded by the people who are making all the money. We're already seeing it in the United States. We're beginning to see it in the United Kingdom. On the Financial Times yesterday reported that most of the jobs created in the United Kingdom were in uh, low skill services like uh, retailing, like house cleaning, uh, dog walking, uh, healthcare especially. In the 1950s, we thought we were onto a revolution because we mechanized house cleaning. In the 2000s, we recruited people and passed those machines onto them. So we created <coughs> the new jobs like there used to be before these machines. <coughs> so the inequality challenge is how do you make sure that the pay for those people is sufficiently high to close the gap between them and the people that you've been talking about, the ones who are getting all the education at MIT and Berkeley and LSE and, and, and all that. And, and, and the reason I raise my hand that I see inequality rising is that I just don't see any institutions or mechanisms in the, Un in the United States, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom, and increasingly in <coughs> continental Europe, with the exception, exception of Scandinavia, I should say, where there is a mechanism that ensures that those jobs are well-paid jobs. Down. The barriers going down. Oh, good. Question over here. If, if we look at the, at the world uh, today, uh, the, the U.S. is a poor analog of the world today, as was said. Uh, but um, uh, the fundamental difference in inequality in the world is not that we're all participating in the company and the CEO makes so much money than, than the workers at the bottom. It's that in some parts of the world, productivity is 10 times, 100 times, 400 times higher than in other parts of the world. And the reason why it's so low is because, as Ajay say, people are disconnected from the networks that will make them productive. They are disconnected from the electricity network, from the water network, from the road network, from the urban transport network, from the education network, from the labor market network, and so on. All of these networks involve some fixed cost of connecting. Uh, once you are connected, variable costs collapse, yeah. right? Uh, so, you know, if you are not connected to a water network, you have to go and fetch water. But if you are connected, an additional liter of water is very cheap. Now, what we know, say, from India, is that uh, there's 2% of the population has landlines, 75% of the population has cell phones, and the median Indian person doesn't have piped water. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that if technology allows us to reduce fixed costs, in networks expand massively. But the reason why a water, piped water, has not diffused in India is not that it started later than cell phones. It's that it faces larger fixed costs. Yeah. So there are some things where technology cannot help. And, and as Eric was saying, maybe policy has to help. And I want to bring in just one example. In 1775, one year before the US independence, the Continental Congress created the US Postal Service. And the US Postal Service was supposed to connect every single incorporated city to the postal network at a fixed cost. So there was the idea at the time that if you are going to be in the US, you are part of this network. And the US Postal Service is, is a part of the network. Do we want to make, say, broadband follow that philosophy? Do we want to make other things, I mean, the universal access to some networks as being a fundamental empowering aspect to allow inclusive growth? Well, I'm going to stop there for a second and, ask, and actually ask the panel that, because I think that's a great question. It really picks up on what um, Professor Tyson was saying in terms of, is it time to simply say that governments should be investing in education, investing in infrastructure, but then who should pay for that? Should it be taxes to pay for governments, or should private sector be paying directly, or companies? Um, 
my sense is that the private sector has to contribute to that. Um, today, we live in times where the corporations, including my own, have a disproportionate amount of resources and wealth. So therefore, we must contribute to that. And I think uh, one of the fundamental reasons that a lot of people, including us on the panel, raised our hands on the inequality question is, is just the inertia of the amount of, um, of, of wealth that gets accumulated. Uh, it grows. Unfortunately, it grows faster than the rate of growth overall that we see in the economy around us. And that is something that uh, uh, the, that momentum is difficult to turn around. However, in, in these kinds of high fixed cost type of uh, types of areas, and I see that in India all the time, roads in India, I mean, all of you have traveled in, uh, within India, uh, trains, uh, the infrastructure, uh, this requires investments, and I don't believe that government alone can can enable that. They have to contribute, they have to initiate and, and coordinate. However, the, the private sector has to contribute to this. So are you willing to make a large contribution to it yourself? We do it already. We do a huge amount of work in this area, in, um, you know, in smart cities and things like this. We have to, uh, we have to. So should, should companies all be paying, say, 5% tax or something towards a fund? Would you like to be willing, coming from Sweden, would you be ready to pay more tax? I think there are different school and education models. I think US is very different from Sweden. We have to be very clear on that. I mean, I think that many countries in the world will actually reduce their cost by using digital education, by digitalizing the content locally. If the infrastructure is there, the broadband will there, if you listen to me now, that will be there. So it's going to be cheaper for a country long term. GDP development and possibility to give a, f a really good education material that is digital. Today, many poor people cannot get education and they need to have printed book and get in now. This is going to be cheaper for government finally. Of course, public sector and private sector should be part with them. Private should show what we can do with technology and our skilled people. So that's no debate about it. So, but we need to understand there are different education systems when we talk about revenues, which is for the US. In the rest of the world, or in many places at least, it's actually going to reduce the cost by using the digital platform to get education out. Right. Peter, what about America? Do you think that um, it's time for American companies to pay more for improving the education system I, I, for individuals I, we pay, or infrastructure? I think, uh, we, I, I think we pay that cost anyhow just because of the supply-demand equation that exists. But, but I do think that it has to be a partnership between the private sector and the public sector. And whether that's a function of the public sector creating incentives for the private sector to do it through tax credits or whatever it may be, I think it has to be joint. Because uh, I don't think the, the, the public sector, particularly with elected officials who, who run through cycles and terms and so forth and have different objectives with regard to what they do, they can't do it on their on their own. There has to be a, a, a really a partnership going forward. Either of you wish to comment? Well, I, I think it's it's bizarre and scandalous that we've cut our public investment so much in the United States. I mean, from on the order of six percent of, of GDP for R and D, for instance, down to, to three percent. Um, at, with, at an era of, of record low interest rates, it's a strange time to be not investing to reinvesting so much less. That said, I want to stress what, what, what was said several times here. The bigger gains are going to come from reinventing education yeah. and reinventing the way we do things. I mean, certainly we can, we can spend more money, but let's not take our eye off the ball that we have an opportunity to fundamentally rethink the way education is done using some of these, you know, datafication, di digital techniques to understand better what works and what doesn't work. Just as companies and industries are being reinvented, uh, we have to reinvent education, we have to reinvent the, the research process. That's ultimately where some of the, the biggest gains are going to be come from. But that doesn't excuse this bizarre uh, uh, cut in, in, in public investment. Ajay, so then I, I started out by talking about the network angle and the infrastructure and investment in education and infrastructure. That's still where I am. And I believe that has to come with a great deal of public sector involvement. You won't get those fixed costs set up by private sector companies alone. Uh, you know, frankly, roads in India need improvement. Roads in Manhattan suck. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the world so, supposedly. So is, I, is, is um, cell connectivity. Yeah, it's cell like being connectivity. in a third world country. Yeah. So we've got infrastructure we investment around yeah. the world. <laughs> Do yeah. I can every day, but continue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I want to make sure we don't take this out as being only investing in telecommunication technology. I'm really, that's just an example of what can come out from the investments that will go into education and infrastructure. 
telecommunications and connectivity are a very important aspect, but it's not the only aspect. You need, you need a whole village to make this happen. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is that I believe that governments are extremely inefficient in the way they currently spend their money. So I'll give you a small example from my, my own life about financial inclusion. We participate with governments around the world to intervene in their payment of subsidies to their citizens. In the last two years, we are doing 500 programs in 53 countries that today are reaching 100 million people who didn't have an account before we started this work two years ago. You can make a difference. I'm actually doing it with Hans yes. as one of them, with Budi as another partner, with my friends in Visa yep. as another partner. So we, you've got to do this in a collaborative mm -hmm. way as compared to me versus you. Mm -hmm. The issue is the wastage, the average wastage, what's called leakage in the emerging world, which basically is translated into theft is between 35 and 42% of every dollar that governments pay to their citizenry for a subsidy. So, to give you an example, the public distribution system in the state of Punjab in India, which buys $8 billion of wheat a year from the farmers to provide it to the other parts of the country which may not have access to that quality of wheat, that's an $8 billion program. When we intervened in the way they were paying the farmer, through, they were going through agents, and the agent was in the driver's seat, and the farmer was watching on the roadside. Well, we now have a card in the way. They found 39% saving of mm. 8 billion in a country where $4 billion is a big lot of money to change education and infrastructure. So my plea here is, don't make it only about taxes, and don't make it only about contributions. Make it about governments carrying their weight by being caring about productivity, efficiency, and killing corruption because they are the biggest source of corruption in the system. Yes. Right. That's that right. needs to change. Agreed. Right. I think we have a question um, over here. I have time for perhaps one or two comments or questions quickly. One, one or two more. Hi. Um, Naveen Manan, A.T. Khani. Um, I was going to say actually something along the lines of what Ajay was saying. I mean, the, it's not just a technology uh, issue, infrastructure issue. Uh, I, I do some work with the forum on data for development or tech for humanity. And we found you know, some very interesting facts, like data is everywhere. We, it's like water. It's everywhere, but it doesn't get to the people that need it the most. Um, one example which I found which was particularly insightful was around how mapping data exists. If you go to Manhattan or you go to any of these developed cities, you can, you can pinpoint to the nearest meter certain you know, pieces of information. And the algorithms that sit behind the, the mapping infrastructure are now reading road signs that exist on the road. But if you go to you know, villages in Africa or even Palawan in the Philippines where I was recently, there are no roads, there are no road signs. So in order for technology to really make an impact and equalize or even redistribute, you have to leapfrog. And the point is you can't leapfrog now because you don't have all the other parts of the ecosystem working together. Right. OK, we have um, time for one more comment or question. Everyone's stunned in silence. I, Ricardo, is, are you listening to him talk about data and the use of data for transforming things? That's a, he's, he's one of the world's experts on that space. And he's sitting there, so maybe a give us a little bit of insight on that. Well, um, uh, I think uh, uh, people, I mean, stuff is done with information and know-how. That's how we make things. Right? Other things, we think it's made with money and effort, but it's really money and effort without information and know-how doesn't get you where you want. And uh, connecting people to that information and to that know-how is and to those possibilities is, is where things are at. So my, my view of development is that development is the accumulation of know-how, uh, more social know-how in society, but you, know, you cannot go from making coffee to making airplanes in one fell swoop because you cannot bridge that know-how gap so quickly. So you actually move from the things you do now to things that are somewhat in your adjacent possible, in, in, in your cognitive neighborhood. And to make that more explicit, we've developed these tools that I'm going to present on Friday at 3 p.m. in a beta <laughs> zone thing. So uh, you'll have 45 minutes of those tools and those, those attempts at, at, at sharing them. Yeah. Right. Um, Eric, I'm just curious. When you look at the world mm -hmm. today, given that you look at technology for a living, do you feel more optimistic about the 
next, say, three, five years than you did three or four, five years ago? Well, I'm extremely optimistic, more optimistic um, about what's happening with technology. I've, I've spent some more time with, with people and, and I thought we were, you know, a little aggressive in some of the predictions we made in the, in the book about what technology was doing, but now I feel like we were actually not aggressive enough. What's happening, say, like, you know, give you the, we started with talking about the self-driving car and how mm. surprised we were. Um, now they're, they're doing much more advanced things, not using LIDAR and pre-mapping, but with vision systems because deep learning has progressed to the point where we can recognize objects much better and, and that same technology is being used for voice and language, it's for using for, for credit scoring and lots of other types of, of problem solving. So that has advanced much more rapidly. Um, I continue to be as concerned or maybe even more concerned about what we're doing in terms of the economy and our institutions and, and our ability or our willingness to respond to it. And, and I want to stress, you know, picking up on, on, on what I said maybe a little glibly earlier about what's going to happen with inequality, uh, the, the uh, real key to understand is that we shouldn't think about technology doing these things to us or what's going to happen to us. This is, we, we have more powerful tools than we've ever had in history. And tools can be used by us to shape the world. So the question is, what do we want to do with these tools? And we have to change the mindset to not be sitting here and thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to, what's going to happen? It's not like these things just happen to us. We decide. And once we realize that, and we realize that we have these incredibly powerful tools, we can shape the world to create shared prosperity. I have no doubt we can do that. We've done it before with earlier revolutions. It's a matter of deciding to do it. Well, that's a wonderful clarion call for action and a good point on which to end. I mean, I found this a fascinating discussion, and thank you to all of you for being so lively, such lively participants. Um, I take away really three key points. Firstly, that collectively we're all wildly optimistic about the ability of technology to allow us to do more and more things, um, and ir irrespective of the threat of cyber attacks and things like that. Collectively, we're pretty pessimistic about the outlook for income inequality. Piketty was right, we seem to think, um, even though probably none of us have actually read the whole of his book. <laughs> um, and the real, <laughs> the real question is, um, in my mind, you know, if we are going to address these issues, as Eric says, by taking control of the situation, how are we going to build the infrastructure? How are we going to build the education? And above all else, who is going to pay for it? That, to my mind, is one of the key questions. So thank you to the fantastic panel. Thank you to all of you, and best of luck in thank sorting you. out the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.